everyone and welcome to the Chef's Table series. My name is Carol O'Connor, co-host of this educational cooking show. Today we are in West Roxbury, Massachusetts at the Joches Altenheimer located at 2222 Center Street. We are featuring culinary director Jim Alabrandi, Michelle Sierra, she's the executive chef, and my co-host Joe Murphy. All three of them will be making these amazing dishes in front of me. Caprese salad, stick, twice baked potato, vegetable stuffed mushroom cap, my favorite, rolled eggplant parmesan, and everyone's favorite, beef tenderloin served with the twice baked potato and broccoli florets. And later on, we're going to be seeing some beautiful Christmas lights when I walk along the um, inside of the Deutsches Altenheim with CEO Gregory Carr. So let's bring over Jim, Joe, and Michelle to learn how to make these delicious dishes. Hi, I'm Chef Joe Murphy. I am the co-host of the Chef's Table series. This show is produced by the Chef's Table Foundation, which is dedicated to supporting homeless U.S. veterans, and there are 6,000 homeless teens documented in the state, and our mission is to raise money so that we can offer them a culinary school education so that they can return, hopefully, to whatever normal way of life is today, but at least give them a foundation so that they can really take care of themselves. And we're very pleased today be, to be at the Deutsches Altenheim in West Roxbury. And it's a wonderful facility, and they work with people that may have some uh, recuperative time. You have extended living. Uh, assisted living. Assisted living. Long-term care. Yeah, so there are many. Adult day care. Great. Okay. So I know where to go next. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, we're very pleased today. This is the second time we've been here, and this is our Christmas show shooting, and or videoing. We're not shooting anybody, and today <laughs> we have two superstars back. We have uh, the director of food, culinary director, Jim Alabrandi, and the executive chef, Michelle Sear. So today, Chef, uh, what are we going to be making? We're going to be making uh, three appetizers first. We're going to okay. do a caprese salad yeah. and a uh, rolled eggplant parmesan. And we're going to do a vegetable stuffed mushroom. Excellent. Okay. Uh, I'd like to say something before we start. Thank you for everybody showing up. And uh, I know we have a few veterans in here. I'm a veteran myself. Great. And I'd like to thank everybody for uh, showing up for the veterans. Uh, U.S. Foods, who is my supplier, has donated everything you're going to taste and everything you're going to eat oh, excellent. to the Altenheim to you. So excellent. I think that's really, really a great, you know, great thing yeah. to get them uh, recognized like sure. that and to, and to sure. supply everything we have right. up here this evening. Right. Yeah. So that's uh, one of the things I wanted to okay. mention. Okay, thank you. Uh, just keep in mind, as the chef, uh, they're both chefs. Uh, Jim and Michelle, uh, this show is designed to be instructional. I'll be pointing out what I think are really good tips, and then they'll be offering tips. So you're learning from professional chefs that have been chefing for quite some time, and each chef can have a little bit different twist or approach to prepping different type foods. So just keep in mind, if you want to rewatch this show, or to get the recipes and cook along with the chefs, if you go to chefstableseries.tv, you can rewatch this production. Okay. Okay, so what I have here class, is, right? yep, right up. We've got everything that we're going to need for this evening, as well as Michelle on her side. Right. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Caprizi salad. So we start with a fresh mozzarella ball, right? Right. Take some uh, fresh basil, kind of fold it up. Put it in that like that. And a nice cherry tomato, really simple. And then you could put whatever dressing you want. Uh, basically, this is something that I just saw on the, on the Food Network myself. Yeah. Uh, 
you can do anything you want with these. Uh, you can put anything else in between them if you wanted to. Uh, I find that uh, they're very versatile, right? Because uh, you can wear them as earrings right. or a necklace. Very good. And, and they're very festive. So yeah. that's how that would look. So there you go. So there's one appetizer. Great. That's yeah. pretty quick. And one thing we talk about on the show is one thing we always mention is the French term mise en place, which means exactly. have everything in this place. In a professional kitchen, this is where it all begins. Have all your ingredients ready so that you don't miss a, a key ingredient when you're preparing. And what you do is you have them lined up and you're just ready to go. All right, sure. Okay, the next thing we're going to demonstrate, and you'll probably be tasting them shortly, is a uh, vegetable stuffed mushroom. So we like a little bit of olive oil in the frying pan, just a test. And what we have is a small bit of yellow squash. Nice. We've got the mushroom stem, and it's really simple. I don't use a knife with it. Break the stem off yeah. and just because it's, it's, it's like threads, as you know how it is, it's yeah. silky, and you put it in like that so you have more or less like chunks. Right. So there's some, some of that. Then there's some fresh spinach chopped up. There's also some zucchini chopped up. Yeah. And down below, we've got a few onions. Right. And that will be the stuffing. Right. One, one thing I'd like to mention here is uh, the dice that yeah. size is a, it's a like small like dice. It's it's a, is yep. it, That's what I like. Let, so okay. I like to work with because it, again, you want it to really break down, right. and it does have to fit inside the mushroom cap. Right. Okay. okay. We put a little bit of garlic powder. Yeah. We use a little bit of uh, onion powder. And remember, when when you're cooking, you're the creator. This is really a craft. It's a pinch of basil and. Think in terms of TT, two taste. So if you don't want garlic or onion powder, you know, use your own discretion. If you love it, put as much as you want in because it's your guest, your family, and your palate. So I just put in some fresh chopped garlic, a little bit of black pepper. Like you said, it is to taste. And uh, she'll saute that down. And what happens is, Again, we we'll take our mushroom caps, and the, you know the secret to mushrooms is you don't wet them, you don't wash them, you dry them. Right. So any kind of usually dirt, it, it just like this because it's a very porous vegetable. You lay them in like that. Right. You don't need it to take on any more moisture. Liquid yeah. Or moisture. So you just brush them. That's a great tip if you're not used to. It. Work with mushrooms. And then as it goes down a little bit more, we put a little bit of Romano cheese. Ooh. There's quite a few ingredients in it. No salt, as you see. No salt. Right. No need. Is that because uh, of the type of cooking? Yeah, yeah, it's, oh. yeah, we, yeah. We do low sodium. Everything low sodium bases, like I mentioned the last time. Yeah. And uh, we do. We make. 90% of everything in house, our Salisbury steaks, right. our rolled chicken, you meatballs. know, meatballs. Uh, you know, we just do everything so there's no, you know, a lot less than a processed product, you know. Right, which is great. Yeah. Now, I want to point out one thing Chef Michelle is uh, tool she's using. That spatula with the red handle is heat tempered. <coughs> so it's not going to melt in your saute pan with the heat. So if you like using, as Michelle is using, you know, a spatula to move things around, buy yourself a really good, you know, a red handle spatula. And that's what it's designed for. Okay, so because of the time restriction, we'll put a little bit of a Red crumb that goes in there kind of holds it together. Right. So that's the fine. Yep. And it's a non-seasoned. Oh. I don't use any seasoned bread crumb. Right. No. Nope. Yeah. I mean, I don't years like, ago I used to, but right. it, it's too salty. Right. I don't like seasoned bread crumbs. I feel seasoned no, yourself, no. and then you're going to have two taste. Yep. As you like it. And and plus, 
there's so much flavor going into the stuffing that you want to be able to still taste the mushroom. Right. You know? Exactly. Yeah, and that chef just gave a great tip. You know, I always talk about this. It's sort of my thing that gives me angst. Garlic is an ingredient. Do not make it the dish. Yeah. And don't over season with any particular okay. herb or, or seasoning because you want all those flavors to come together. Don't make it the dish. So I would just, you know, I wouldn't be handling this when it's hot, as hot as it is, I should say. And uh, you'd go like this, and that would be our dish, yeah. and you'd bake it. Yeah, and what the ingredients so there you go with that. Uh, chef used here, I'll tell you, the aroma is fantastic. How do they taste it? Is the, I mean, seriously? Oh, good. Well, that's good to know. Okay. Now we'll, uh, we're going to move on to our rolled eggplant. All right, before we do the... Before you get started, could yep. you tell the, the audience and our TV viewers what the ingredients are? We'll talk about the mise en place. The rolled eggplant is fresh eggplant sliced on a slicer, lengthwise, okay? Right. It also consists of mozzarella cheese sliced lengthwise, okay? We then egg and flour the eggplant. Right. Cutlet, and then we we fry it. After that's done, we put a, you know a lot of tomato sauce, which we'll be doing, and you roll it, and then you put it seam side down, and a little bit more tomato sauce over it. Sprinkle it with a little cheese, a little bit of parsley, and bake it. Okay. And that's how that works. Right now, you know, uh, chef was just talking about slicing. Most homes, I don't know of any homes except for mine, I have a commercial meat slicer. But yeah. just have a good knife, a good sharp yep. knife. It's your, it's your best friend. Yeah. And if you have a, a rounded vegetable that you need to slice, <clears throat> on one side, cut a f flat spot so that when you start slicing your thin slices, it's not going to roll, you're not going to slip and cut yourself. So keep that in mind. Um, what I'm doing now is, again, we used pasteurized eggs. They have a pea on them. And uh, in that case, we could, even though we're going to cook this, it's still a raw egg. And uh, you don't want to, you know, salmonella and all the things that happen with raw eggs and chicken and poultry and all that stuff. Uh, so we can give people in the Altenheim a soft egg. They die for, they, you know, even though they're 80, 90 years old, they're always saying, can I please have a poached egg with some yolk? You know, so with the pasteurized eggs, we're all set. So what I've done is I've broken up a couple of eggs and just need a little bit of mixing around. And if you notice, I, I don't have any big industrial thing, whips around, I'm just using a fork, you know? Yeah, which is They like that girls back there, they like that. You know, and, and he just did give you another tip. You, you can substitute different types of tools. For instance, keep yep. it simple, fork. You know, all he's doing is scrambling. And I, I'm not wearing any gloves because we're not going to be eating this this evening or any evening. But it's right. for me, it's my hands are clean. So then you throw it right into the breadcrumbs, cover it over, cover it over, pat it. I mean, you gotta like what you're doing too. I mean, you just can't throw it, you know, I like to cover every spot one or two, one or, two or three times. Yeah. There's the cutlet, it's a good quarter inch thick. Is that hot now? Uh -huh. We're gonna put it in. She's gonna fry that up. Yeah, can I just ask you a question? Yep. You know, a normal technique is flour, egg, and water. I've seen many chefs Eliminate the flour. I don't use flour on anything like this. Okay. Okay, flour, yes, on fish, yeah. on those types of items, it does seal in. Right. And it will, uh, then you'd go to another egg wash and then yeah. you'd go into yellow flour. Right. If you were going to do something like a battered fish. But yeah. uh, for this, I, find I don't use any flour at all. But I, ha right. I have, you, you know, I have seen people use right. flour. Yeah, and I've seen people just, they won't use breadcrumbs. Yeah. They'll just use yeah. flour yeah. and egg. Yeah. But what the yeah. flour does, just so you know what the the uh, the technical side of that is, you put flour 
you, you dredge it in the flour. Knock off your excess flour, okay, because it'll show up when you're cooking. Then you dip it in the egg wash, and then your bread crumbs. All right, now, one tip. I have a friend uh, who's a wonderful chef from Italy. In Italy and from his region, they don't use breadcrumbs because they feel it holds too much oil. I love mm. the breadcrumbs, so. I, I do too, Yeah. but yeah. Okay, so that looks done. She's gonna just put it on this. We'll take a little bit of the oil off. Yeah. And again, it's olive oil. Right. So. Let me ask you a question, Chef. Okay. So you've got the breadcrumbs nice and brown, which is yep. great. Now you're gonna put the cheese sauce, and then do you bake, bake it? it. Yeah. Okay. We're gonna take right. If this isn't cooked through, remember it is going in the. Oven. Oh yeah. No, this is this is gets cooked for another 45 minutes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so what happens is this. Now that I have the cutlet yeah. and the in the um, cheese, you just kind of roll it just like this. Right. It's very hot. Keep it seam side down. The trick is you've got to have, which is, a, this is like a marinara. You've got to have enough sauce on the bottom. Right. You take it, place it in. A little bit more sauce on top. Mm. This is one of my favorite dishes. I, and I love again, a little bit of Romano, <clears throat> a few parsley flakes. Uh -huh. And this is baked for 45 minutes, covered for about 30. Yeah. Okay? Because the, even though that cheese is gonna melt, the sauce is gonna go, the eggplant's gonna get soft and tender, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's so, like this evening's, we, I probably cooked for a little bit more than 45 minutes. Okay, so that's, that's with that. So they're gonna start to hand those out. Okay, I'm gonna put this over here. Yep. Can I can put this one like this. Yeah. Okay. Here's okay, thank you. You got it? Yeah, got it. And that's the other appetizer put in there. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is a twice baked potato. Oh, cool. This is Michelle's going to demonstrate this. And we serve this. Uh, you know, we serve the rolled eggplant. That We serve that, the caprese salad. We serve this on a regular basis to... Uh, uh, folks here. Yeah. So we so, do what you bake off on. Um, we bake off some potatoes. We let them cool down enough. We cut them out. Cut them in half, and then we scoop out some of the filling. We leave a little bit of meat in there, mm -hmm. and then you add some fillings. Good old potato. So it's all potato. This is all, the, this is all the filling inside from all the potatoes. Put bacon. Ooh. Chives. Nice. A little sour cream. Mm. And she had butter already in the potatoes, right? I had butter right? already in the potatoes. I yep. added earlier. And there's some cheddar. And you just mix it all up. Mm -hmm. And you restuff the potato. Now, if you were going to do this for the holidays, sometimes you pipe it. Mm -hmm. Instead I'll of just pipe them, yep. pipe them all on. I'm doing 200 of them. Yeah. Wow. So you, are you mashing them to yes, pipe I'm them? Yes, I'm mixing it all in, mashing the potatoes right. with all. And they come out beautiful. Yeah. yeah, I know. Um, yeah, and this is, uh, I think, particularly during the holidays, everybody's running. So... Chef Michelle, make ahead. you can make make them ahead goodies. and freeze them. You can freeze we them. We can freeze them too. Yeah. Make great. them ahead and freeze them. Yeah, so that's a great tip. And this is, a, I think most people oh, would love a twice yeah. baked potato. Oh my god, yeah. 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 So are you baking these at your home? Yes, I do. I do. Good. I may make them at home all the time. So what time would you like to <laughs> the show? Oh, at my home. Oh, Michelle. Yeah, anytime. Yeah. Uh, my, I'm open to a company all the time. Okay. There we go. Well, that's one thing about a chef. They are very. So there's oh twice baked potato, and yeah, we might there. just to dance it up a little bit, a little bam, bam, you know. So there you go. Yeah. Okay. So that's that. Now, um, the last thing we're gonna kind of demonstrate to you is just the tenderloin, uh, which you're you're gonna have this evening. So. I'll pick it up. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to uh, briefly tell you about the tenderloin, and uh, Michelle will uh, will demonstrate what she puts on it. Doesn't need much, hence the name tenderloin. Okay. Right. And uh, 
technically, my great great grandfather invented this meat. Uh, <laughs> oh, gotcha. Huh? <laughs> yeah, forgot. Sorry. Uh, Antonio Fresco Ali Brandi yeah. had the uh, the meat tenderizing that he brought to this country almost 30, 40 years ago, because this is a very tender piece of meat that it didn't need much. Right. So he taught everybody that you would, you know, <laughs> you would just gently say to the meat, be, be tender, you know, nice, be good, you know, and that's all this type of piece of beef needs, right? Wow. Or, and for the last coup de gras, you would sing it a lullaby, you know, possibly a little bit of uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. Yeah. This house is a very, very nice house. You know? So that's how, that's how Chef, I, I learned I, how to tenderize. Yeah, that, I, you know, and folks, that was a great tip. But I, have, yeah. I, have, I have one question. What? Which alabrandry was nuttier, you or your grandfather? <laughs> I think Constantino, my grandfather was. Okay, I'm not sure. Good. All right. Okay. All right. Well, what I do with these is I, <clears throat> I have this stuff they call Montreal Steak Spice. You can buy pretty much a lot of places sell it now. Uh, and all I do is just rub it all down. And I put it in a nice hot oven. Kind of seal it up. Goes in about 300, 325 for about 45 minutes to an hour. Check internal temperature about 115 to 120. We want to pull it. Okay. That way, there's going to give you the medium rare to your rare. Right. And then you're going to let it sit. Take it out of the hot pan. Let it sit on the cutting board, a nice right. cool place. Yeah. Let it. And Chef all the just juices. gave you a great tip. This is a great an expensive cut of meat, but it doesn't make any difference which cut, whether it's poultry. Do exactly what Chef said. Don't take it out and start cutting it. You want all those juices to reconstitute mm -hmm. in the poultry, the meat, so let it rest. And another thing is I do exactly as you say, Chef. I'll take it out, put it on the cutting board, but I'll also put a clean mm -hmm. bench towel mm -hmm. over it mm -hmm. And, you know, if you've undercooked that a little bit, it's going to, with the residual heat, it will continue cooking. Mm -hmm. So. Great. Yeah. We serve this um, quite often here. They have wow. it here yep. now. Yeah. Right. The whole house gets this. Really? And yep. what day is that? It's on a Sunday. It's on a Sunday. It's on a Sunday. Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's on last Sunday. So I, yeah. I missed, I missed yeah. two <laughs> days ago. Is what yeah. Saying. Yeah. And what time is service? 12. 12. 12. Well, okay. Great. 12 to one thirty. All right. So, Chef, I didn't so, need to interrupt, but... You know, we had a little bit of nutty digression there, but with the Alibrandi <laughs> clan. So, you season that. Now, do you put this, it's a, it's a rub. Is, yeah, I it's guess. just a dry rub. It's all yeah. this is like garlic Black and pepper, pepper yeah. and yeah. onion, you know, dehydrated onion and stuff like that. Right, so here's my question. Do you do that an hour before, the day before? What do you I do this probably, by, I'll take this out and let it come to room temp for about like about 20 minutes to half hour, for half hour. Okay. Let it get warm, because you don't want to put a cold piece of meat like that in she the She wants oven. to get a room temperature. Room right, temp. Right, and I'm thinking too, and that's a great tip Chef just gave you, get it to room temperature. Right. Mm -hmm. I try Cooks to better. do that myself. Yeah. But the I don't like to put the dryer rub on too soon. That's what I want Because the salt and any other, will absorb the meat. Uh, it'll take away from the meat. It'll take, it'll suck the juice The juice is right of out of the meat. Okay, yeah. great. All right, so, and then do you tie it or roll it or put it in nope. flat? Just put it in flat on a sheet pan and just bake it in flat. Wow, and nope. you're saying 325 about at? About 300, 325. For how many minutes a pound? About half hour, well, about 45 minutes to an hour. I, I, could, I go by temperature. Eight, I take eight to 10, 12 minutes a pound. Five. Yeah. Right. I do too. You know, I can't tell you. I was at my daughter's the other night, and you can buy these food thermometers mm -hmm. in the supermarket. Yeah. I don't like them. They mm -hmm. don't work. Yeah. I, I don't think you can get a professional one at some of the better, you know, stores, but in any event, they're not that expensive. And I don't worry about how long it's cooked. Mm -hmm. I worry about the internal temperature. Right. And that's how it's the I do it. the thickest part of the meat as well. Right. Right. Yeah. So. Because this will give you two different temperatures if you yes. take it out. Right. 
and that's also good for service. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. your thicker side could be medium rare, but your you other end could be thinner, and you could have more well done mm -hmm. because some people like it exactly, that way, which is great. Yeah. All right. And the only thing that uh, we won't demo, we're going to talk. We have a homemade bread pudding, mm -hmm. which basically is a little bit of raisin bread and wheat bread and white bread sitting out overnight, get it kind of crusty. Mm -hmm. And then without, you know, your custard. eggs and custard and cream. And yeah. uh, we mix that together and we bake that with a water bath. Yeah. And you'll uh, be having that for dessert tonight too with a little bit of whipped cream on it. Wow. So. Wow. <laughs> So the people that missed the show, they're definitely going to show up some Sunday. Uh, yeah, Melbourne, okay? they should. <laughs> All right. They great. should. All right. So you've seen one, two, three, four dishes. There's your fifth. The, that's your, your main. Center of the plate right there. Yep. Right, your protein. So we're very grateful again to Deutsches Altenheim. We're grateful to uh, Chef Mich Michelle Sear. We're grateful also to... Chef Jim Alibrandi and what was his name? Guido? Guido. Guido Panzini <laughs> Alibrandi. Alibrandi. Okay. Sounds great. And uh, we hope you enjoy this Christmas show. Excuse uh, me, Joe. Yeah. I'd like to thank you and your crew for what you do for the veterans. Oh, I mean, I think you. it's really a wonderful thing that we have people. Thank you. Um, that, that, that can, uh, you know, go out. It's not easy to get money for these types of things. Right. You know, money is tough no matter where you go. Exactly. But whatever you can get and whatever we can do, uh, I know, uh, you know, uh, we like to go to the Fisher House. Uh, Carol Kelly does so much with the veterans Excellent. here in Roxbury and what she does and so forth. And uh, But if there's anything else we can do for you, you know. Thank you. Let, let us know. Yeah, and, you know, it takes time to build relationships when you come out of the gate, you think, oh, we're going to knock them down. Yeah, yeah. It's really about Hard. relationship yeah, building. Yeah. So you people have been fantastic with us. And there'll be, you know, we're going to have a number of segments, your tree lighting on the show. Yep. So it's going to be really great. And uh, Greg Carr, who, who is the CEO here, has been fantastic to work with Carol Kelly, as you say. Yeah. And, of course, the fabulous... Michelle. <laughs> I agree. So, uh, good friend, Jim Alexander. I agree. So, in closing, on behalf of the Chef's Table Foundation, we'd really love to hear from you. And if you want to, again, rewatch this show, get the recipes, and cook along with the chefs, you can do that. Bring your iPad down to the kitchen. Don't forget to get your mise en place together. And again, you know, we're coming into this holiday season, and this is a time of, uh, you know, being grateful, acknowledging, trying to help people. So remember, homeless children, homeless veterans, and everybody deserves a chance. And that's what our foundation is about. So again, thank you on behalf of the Chef's Table Foundation, our crew, and the guest here tonight at Deutsches Altenheim. Thank you. Hello, I'm Kelsey Roth. I'm with Craft Beer Cellar. I'm a certified Cicerone, which is uh, similar to a sommelier, uh, except for beer. And I'm the brand manager over at Craft Beer Cellar. Today I'm here with Jennifer Barrel um, at Barrel Farms. Uh, we're here in their awesome production kitchen um, where they make all the delicious pies and everything else. Um, but uh, we've been asked to pair a beer with uh, a beef tenderloin au jus served with steamed broccoli and cauliflower florets. Um, and I immediately think, you know, uh, beef tenderloin au jus, this is going to be a, a rich dish. Uh, lots of kind of uh, uh, kind of roasty flavors. Um, you know, the steamed broccoli and cauliflower are going to have some nice vegetable character. Um, and uh, I'm going to want a beer. In this case, I want to pick a beer that's going to match that. So intense flavors first. Um, you know, from on the food side, so I want a beer that kind of can match that intensity. Um, and then I want to. I'm looking to match those roasty kind of characters. So I went with a. a uh, porter, and this is a dark beer. Um, uh, it 
came about, um, you know, I'd say it got its name in about 1840s in London when um, a, a lot of the, uh, brewers in London started brewing this style of beer for the dock workers. And the porters, after they got off shift, would come and flood into the taverns and pubs and they would drink a bunch of this beer. And eventually it's called the porter because of the porters who would drink a lot of it. Um, but uh, this style originated before stout. A lot of people think uh, stout's going to be the you know, uh, you know, the original one. But this came about before stout. Stout originally was stout porter. Um, so it was just a heavier porter. Um, so so porter, stout's heavier? Um, it, it started off that way. Now if you think of like a Guinness, uh, Guinness is actually lower in alcohol than most porters. Uh, Guinness is only about 4.2%. Um, so that's a fairly light stout. Um, so it's changed over the years, but originally it meant the heavier, the heavier porter. Um, but this porter is brewed by Mayflower Brewing Company. They are located right here in Massachusetts, over in Plymouth, um, and they started off doing some really great classic English styles, and this is one of them that they still brew. Um, and this beer has some really great roasty character to it. Um, as you can see, it's got a nice dark, rich color there, um, almost completely opaque. And I can tell one thing right off the bat, um, you know, there's gonna be some nice richness to this because the head itself is even a little bit, you know, it's got a little yeah. tan color to it. Um, but I can't see through that at all. Um, and so it's, you know, a fairly dark color. And when I stick my nose in there, I'm getting some really nice kind of uh, fresh roasted coffee bean, um, almost like espresso bean, some you know, dark baker's chocolate, um, and almost a, a little bit of smoke or even a little tobacco. Yeah. You get the tobacco. Kind of similar flavors, yeah. Similar flavors on on, on the sip as well. Um, you know, it, it lingers a little bit. It's got some nice bitterness there that's going to help um, kind of cut the richness of the that uh, beef tenderloin. And these roasted flavors are just going to match that that dish really nicely. Just kind of match it in intensity. You can get the coffee taste more when you're when you're drinking it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if somebody you know. If somebody's not a fan of coffee, I usually don't steer them towards this kind of beer because they can naturally have it. Yeah. And uh, an interesting thing is that um, a lot of uh, stouts and porters will use what's called patent malt, which um, instead of uh, doing a traditional kilning of, of the barley, they actually use a similar uh, device as you use to roast coffee. Um, so it creates a nice dark roast without charring. Um, but it gives you that nice kind of coffee flavor, uh, dark chocolate flavor. Um, but it's not an overly powerful beer. You know, um, I don't feel that it's like heavy on the mouth feel. No, it it's got some nice lightness to it, which is, just makes it a great food beer as well. But this could also go really nicely with some of your pies. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is Mayflower Porter. Um, we're pairing it with the beef tenderloin au jus. And uh, I recommend that you try it as well. A great local brewery in Mayflower. And um, my name is Kelsey. I'm with Craft Beer Cellar, and we're a proud supporter of the Chef's Table Foundation. And welcome to this week's Farm to Table Tip. I am here with Farmer's Farmer, Steve Barrel, co-owner of Barrel Farm located in Concord. And today we are talking about a celery root. But Steve, it kind of looks like a bowling ball. I never it thought. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. Huh? Even a turnip. Turnip, yeah. <laughs> Maybe a softball. Yeah, yeah. Like I used to play softball. <laughs> yeah. I bet you were good. I was the pitcher. Yeah, I struck him out at a curveball, a twist. <laughs> it was really good. Um, Celery root, otherwise known as celeriac, celeriac, is a member of the celery family, obviously. Um, that's a, a very long season crop. It takes about six months to grow celery root. 
We start that in the greenhouse late February in these plug trays with one plant in each cell, mm -hmm. 128 plants here. And uh, that's very important because that's a uh, biennial crop and you have to keep it warm until it gets through the first season. Uh, if it gets a cold spell of a couple of weeks when it's a young plant, it'll think it's time to think it's going into the second season. Oh, yeah. Start making seed, <laughs> and that it won't grow a nice uh, bulb mm -hmm. like this for the root. I wish I had one that just came out of the field, but we finished harvesting quite a while ago. And when you take them out of the field, yes. they're just a big, they're about three times that size with all hairy roots full of oh, dirt. Really? And there's an awful <laughs> lot of pruning to do in the process of that. Mm. You get them down to looking like this. And, uh, I know my first time pruning, it was a little hard on my hand here, but <laughs> I got so it's pretty good now. It's kind of a benefit. I don't have yeah. to worry about my fingers coming <laughs> right. out here. <laughs> but uh, when this grows in the ground, it, it has a top on it that looks like a small bunch of celery. The yeah. uh, stalks are fine and they're quite tough. Uh, I think the leaves probably have good flavor if you're sure. doing the soup or something. Mm -hmm. Well, let's just take a look yeah, inside. Yeah, I'd love to see what's inside it. Oh, oh that? It's like white. A little yellow to it. Maybe we've got a sample here. Maybe we're going to eat it? Maybe we're going to eat it. Let's try. Pardon my finger. Thank you. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Root vegetable. Tastes wow. like celery? Mm hmm. It tastes nicer. They're very, very popular in the mm. fair soup making. Mm -hmm. We do a nice dish, uh, mashed potato with celery root. Oh! And uh, that's been popular. I would eat that. Mashed potatoes are so boring. Uh, remoulade is a French salad. Mm -hmm. uh, with celery root is one of the prime ingredients for the flavor. But it can be used in salads, grated, fresh soups all kinds of uses and another nice thing about it for New England uh, mm -hmm. it's a very storable crop we can store this in a barn cellar or in a cooler for six or eight months with no problem oh, yeah, I was gonna and ask by you then that. the winter's all over and you're back into the next growing season mm -hmm. and it's a way to get a nice celery type vegetable year round yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good idea so it's very nice in New England yeah I like it Wow, such good, interesting tips today. I love it. So everyone, this has been this week's Farm to Table Tip with Steve Barrel of Barrel Farm. I'm Carol O'Connor, co-host of the Chef's Table Series, and we'll see you next week for the Farm to Table Tip. Barrel Farm, dry ground cover, soil preparation, take two. And we're going to talk about spinach. Spinach, oh, there it is. Oh down a little deeper than I thought. Hi folks, Steve LeCount, chef owner of Chiara Bistro in Westwood, coming at you with this week's chef's tip. Uh, this week I just want to talk about an easy way to get pomegranate seeds out of the pomegranate. Um, I remember when we were kids and we used to call these Chinese apples and you know, we used to quarter them like that, and then we sat around the table, and I think maybe my parents did it on purpose to keep us out of trouble and keep us occupied for a while, and we would just take teaspoons and try to pick out through all this membrane that's completely throughout uh, a pomegranate. Uh, I love pomegranates, uh, great uh, winter use. Uh, you'll see them around all the time. Uh, they make beautiful holiday decorations, uh, but... Um, they are naturally loaded with antioxidants. It's one of the healthiest fruits you can eat. But they have a nice tartness to them and a nice crunch to them too. And I like to contrast in things uh, like salads with goat cheese where you have a soft goat cheese. Uh, you you uh, have a nice contrast to that with the, the crunch from the, uh, and the tartness of uh, the pomegranate. We also tend to use it a lot on duck dishes or chicken dishes with maybe a sweet glaze, something with like honey and molasses or maple. Um, you've got all that sugar going on on that, so you want something tart to slice through that and balance out that dish. So pomegranate seeds uh, seem to be perfect for that. 
Uh, but anyway, back to the original point. How do I get all those seeds out of there without spending half my life doing so? I just cut, cut it in half um, horizontally. Put your hand over a bowl and just like the kid you wanted to keep occupied for hours getting those seeds out, give it a good spanking with a, with a, a heavy kitchen spoon. And you'll see mostly just seeds come out of there. And to get the rest, just keep, keep banging on it with that spoon, and they will come out like that, and you'll have a bowl full of these before you know it. Steve LeCount, Chef Ono Chiara Bistro, and that's this week's Chef's Tip. and welcome to the interview segment of the Chef's Table series. My name is Carol O'Connor. I am here at the Joches Altenheim in West Roxbury with Greg Carr. He is the CEO here. And we're talking about Christmas decorations and Christmas lighting. So Greg, um, tell us about the Christmas lighting here. It's a big deal. And I love Christmas and I love all the holiday lights. And so do the Germans in their <laughs> tradition. Yes. And it's a tradition that's carried forward many years here. Mm -hmm. Uh, about the first week of December really launches the season for us. So the first Friday in December, mm -hmm. uh, we do a tree lighting, which is a whole lot of events all over the campus that take oh. place simultaneously. Okay, what type of events happen? Well, the, of course, Father Christmas uh, is the main event. Father Christmas, all decked out in... Um, a costuming that comes from hundreds of years ago. Oh, yes. uh, you know, so we have a very tall guy who mm -hmm. does a great job, visits all the resident areas on the campus. Mm -hmm. The Sanger Corps, a German choir, uh, comes here, and they're, they're anywhere between 20 and 30 strong, and they will sing carols throughout the campus oh. in all the resident areas. So, it, would you say they'd be strolling? Yes. Along? Oh my God, that's beautiful. Yeah, and um, and of course, there's food and beverage. Yeah. Lots time. of food, you know, yeah. all in the German tradition. And the whole thing is done to keep the um, European tradition of Christmas alive mm -hmm. on this campus. Uh, we're a non-denominational, non-sectarian campus here, mm -hmm. but being of a German uh, origin, mm -hmm. uh, they like to keep those traditions going. Right. So we have the main tree that will be lit. And then you have, do you have other trees that are lit throughout the campus? Simultaneously, yeah. Oh, um, all, the, uh, all the grounds are lit up. Yeah. Um, there are numerous trees throughout the property, mm -hmm. uh, both indoors and out. And it, um, it, it's quite colorful. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. Too bad it wasn't snowing, but <laughs> at least the weather's comfortable enough for people to enjoy themselves outside. Yes. Now, when did you start this? Has this always been a tradition here? Yes, it, it goes back, um, well, we've been here 100 years, right. and my understanding is they started doing this 100 years ago. Oh my God. So you celebrate yeah. 100 years? Yes. Oh my God, that's great. Yeah. And we expect a lot of people to come tonight, correct? Yeah, there'll be several hundred mm -hmm. uh, people from the community, families, friends. Uh, residents, coming, yeah. Residents, yeah. Oh, perfect. All right. I can't wait to um, go outside and check out the tree and the lighting. So great. So great. Thank you so much for being in the interview segment with me. Right. Awesome. So everyone, this has been the interview segment of the Christmas show at the George's Altenheim, and we'll see you next week, and have happy holidays. I see my husband. I want to do but I have to so go to the Enjoy it. It's fine. Don't worry.
worry about it.
basically this is something that I just saw in the, in the Food Network myself. Yeah. Uh, you can do anything you want with these. Uh, you can put anything else in between them if you wanted to. Uh, I find that uh, they're very versatile, right? Thing that he brought to this country almost 30, 40 years ago because this is a very tender piece of bacon. Yeah, and what the so there you go, uh, chef used here, I'll tell you, the aroma is fantastic. How do they taste? Uh, uh, I mean, seriously? Oh, good. Well, that's good to know. Yeah.